Hi, so today we're gonna go over how employers can maximize their employee benefit spend, it's particularly with startup businesses or businesses that are brand new to employee benefits. My name's Melissa DeWeese. I've been doing this for 20 years now, and I know a thing or two about setting up employee benefits for new businesses. I've done hundreds of these, if not thousands, and it's time to get into it, so let's dive in. Okay, so today we're getting into how to maximize employee benefit spend. Employee benefits uh, are getting more and more expensive every year, although this year um, is pretty unprecedented, at least since the 80s, since I've been working, you know, at least since I've been working in the industry uh, where medical inflation is actually less than CPI data. Uh, however, it's still expensive and a large percentage of what employers spend on their employees and in their business to maximize employee engagement, employee retention, and recruiting efforts. So the first thing that I do is I ask a bunch of questions um, of my groups and we go over a questionnaire. I have a link down below if you're interested to see what that looks like or interested to see what I have to offer and how I can improve your employee benefits and maximize your employee benefit spend or any suggestions that I might have surrounding that. So it's a list of questions um, to help me understand exactly what the company's goals and objectives are. I might have an employer who absolutely needs to save money and they are cutting their budget, or I might have an employer that is looking to spend a little bit more, but not break the bank and they want to maximize their recruiting. Maybe they're hiring 10 key uh, areas this year. And um, those are all questions that I need to, I need the answers to, and I need to understand. I also need to understand my client, my client's uh, goals and objectives so that I can align with those and assess priorities. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? What's the budget, right? And one of the big pieces that newer groups or groups new to employee benefits struggle with is the budget. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know how much it's going to cost. The employer may just look at their own personal plan and make assumptions based off that. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? How much is it going to cost? What are other companies offering in my area or in my industry? And can I afford to be competitive? Where to start is with getting pricing before, months before, if not a year before you're ready to launch. So you want to work with someone that is low pressure, that's very consultative, consultative and understands that this is not an immediate hit the go button. That's not a smart way of doing it. You want to get an estimate on how much it's going to cost for your population today or what you plan on your population being. So I've worked met with many employers that may be as little as five employees today, and they plan on hiring five new employees in the next couple of months because they've got this on-ramp. Um, so in that situation, we estimate or can be estimated the average age of and the average demographics. So my point is get out into the marketplace and get some examples of what costs are going to be so that you can build it into your budget. And of course, make some sort of a range, assume that it's going to be 10% more than the quote, just to be safe in case prices go up this year. Last year, prices went up about 6%, which was less than the average CPI data coming in. And that is not normal. It's usually a little bit above CPI data. Uh, medical inflation traditionally has been higher than other consumer price index items. And we see about a 2 to 3% per quarter in medical costs. So it's usually higher than 6%, but this last couple of years has, has also been unprecedented. And 
uh, there have been some reasons behind why it's been less than CPI, one, because CPI is extraordinarily high right now and on an uptrend, and the insurance was not utilized very much in the last couple of years. However, many are anticipating that 2022 is going to be different because those who waited to get procedures, elective procedures, are now scheduling those, or those who procrastinated on getting their preventive services, those conditions are now going to be diagnosed and uh, worked on. Uh, for example, people that haven't gone to the dentist in a couple of years, maybe, or lacked, uh, slacked on their uh, cleanings, may have some more fillings to do uh, this year, okay? Trend information and benchmark information. So just to give you an idea, the average increase over the year since 1999 has been about 4%. So this is including deductible increases. So I know I just said it's been increasing about 2 to 3% a quarter for the last couple of years. However, this is showing what employer or the all-in costs have been, the total amount billed has, has been per person uh, since 1999. And this includes uh, uh, deductible increases and plan degradation year over year. So somebody here might've started out with a $500 deductible and someone here is at a $2,000 deductible, okay? Trend information, this is showing how much deductibles have increased since 2006. And this is to give you an idea of what the benchmark is uh, for most employers. So most large firms are at a, about a $1,400 deductible on average, and a small firm is at about a $2,400 deductible on average, or a silver plan. In many markets, most plans fall into the category of gold, um, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Bronze being the least expensive, platinum being the most expensive and the best coverage. So what do you need to qualify? Um, basically two people. So as long as you have two or more W-2, so it cannot be a owner operator and their spouse, um, just on a LLC or something like that, there has to be a payroll established. Okay. And they have to be non-spousal employees, small group or large group. There are subsets of small group and large group. Uh, most small businesses are going to fall into the small group category, but some may fall into the large group category, depending on your state. So it's state defined. Some see uh, groups that are over 50 as large group, others that are a hundred and more employees fall into large group. So establishing that with your census and your uh, broker or advisor or consultant will help get that information sorted for you and put you into the right market category. So one mistake that I see many new businesses and startups and companies that are brand new to employee benefits do is they make the mistake of shopping with multiple brokers. This can really harm the process uh, make it more complicated for you, uh, actually may end up paying more uh, because of this, and it takes the bargaining power away from the agent that you're working with. So the insurance carriers on the medical side have to release, or on in insurance, the insurance carriers have to release the same rates to every broker. So if the underwriter or the person working on your quote is confused as to which agent is in control of the case, they are not going to work with five different agents on the case and negotiate because every time one agent negotiates a price reduction or a change in benefits, they have to see, send that updated quote to all brokers and communicate that change to all brokers and they just don't want to do that. So that's one the other is that all brokers 
especially on the medical side, it's highly regulated now. All brokers get the same rates. So you just want to find somebody that you know, like, and trust, and that can align with your company's goals and objectives and understands your market. Review all options in your area. So make sure that you know which doctors and hospitals are most important to your employees. This can be done with a survey or a simple email out to your employees getting a list together of non-negotiable doctors that absolutely have to be in the network. We'll make sure that you have incredible access to care for your employees, which is extremely important. And I went over the importance of this in some of my other benchmark um, presentations. Meet your budget and your goals. So again, what came first to take note of So a lot of times just getting a quote for a carrier that works well in your area and looking at bronze, silver, gold, and platinum or, you know, three to four different plans can help you get an idea of what your budget's going to be. And then from there, you can start working on uh, looking at your goals and how to plan that into your budget for next quarter, next year, or the next six months, get some sort of a idea of when that is going to occur. Will this package attract and retain talent? So that's a really top concern of most employers at the moment. And there are ways to maximize your benefit spend, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to get through some of the administrative expectations to make sure that everybody is on the same page and you understand that this is not an overnight implementation. So setting up a group benefits plan is going to take 30 to 60 days, especially if it's your first time enrolling. It can be done faster. However, you are going to be sacrificing some very important items. So there in the underwriting process, the length of time that underwriting takes is similar to a mortgage. There are items that are needed that the underwriter has to have before they'll even start working on your group. So you have to have the group application where they just, this is used to set up you as a group with your name uh, and your some payroll information, how many payroll cycles do you have, where do you want the bill sent, how many employees do you have, and so on. What's your waiting period, how long do new hires have to wait to come onto the plan, etc. They need payroll records, a D9C or some sort of quarterly wage report, most want the D9C, to confirm that you are offering coverage to all eligible employees and also making sure that you're offering coverage to people that are on your working with your company. <laughs> so there has unfortunately been groups that have taken advantage of the system and not been truthful about uh, enrolling people that perhaps were not eligible to get things covered. Um, there's been a lot of shenanigans over the years. So in order to make sure that everybody is following the rules, the underwriter has to look at payroll records to confirm that everyone that is filling out an application is an active employee. And then two, they have to make sure that everyone on payroll has been offered the benefits, everyone who is eligible, because if they do not, they can be held accountable. And that is a liability for them as the insurance company, especially with all the regulations that have happened in insurance. Um, they are audited and they have to make sure that no one is discriminated against is the bottom line employee application. So I have to have an application from every single eligible employee. Again, this is a liability issue. Even if an employee does not want the coverage, we have to get a uh, documentation that the employee has been offered coverage and that they're declining coverage. If later an employee was not offered coverage that should have, that is a liability on the insurance company. Um, and on the employer, and it is not a fun situation. So uh, just to avoid any pitfalls, 
all of the employee applications have to be submitted up front and it is a requirement. The insurance company will not even look at or consider your new enrollment application as a group until you have all applications in the door and accounted for. Initial payment. So most of the insurance companies are doing this electronically now. It's a form where they want a copy of the voided check. They want to know is it ACH, etc. They do want that first month's premium and it has to be there before the plan is active. All right. So that whole underwriting process can take anywhere from two to four weeks, can take longer depending on the response time of the employer and the employees. So as you collect employee applications, you wanna make sure of course that the employees understand their benefits and they are educated on the benefit offerings. If this is not done properly, the employees are not gonna fill out the application. It's hard enough to get the employees to fill out applications or even, even if it's online or offline, it's hard enough to get them to look at their insurances as it is. If there's any ambiguity or confusion around it, you're gonna have a very, very hard time collecting any kind of paperwork from an employee. So you wanna make sure that you are educating your advisors, educating your employees on exactly what is being offered. Uh, you want to have a contact, one contact that the employees know that they can go to within your organization for questions. Of course, the broker, advisor, consultant can be there as well to answer questions. However, there has to be a point person at your organization that's going to be handling this. Otherwise, the process is going to take four times longer than it needs to. Electronic enrollment system can be used as well. This is an absolute wonderful way to make sure that all information is distributed, it's documented, it reduces liability for the employer, it reduces admin for HR or anyone who's the point person handling employee benefits. It helps congruity with uh, new hires and onboarding, make sure that they are getting access to all of the correct information. And it's similar for every single new hire. One issue that happens uh, over and over again with groups that do not have electronic systems is one new hire will get everything they need. It's communicated really well. And then HR gets really bogged down because they go through in a hiring frenzy. There's some sort of crisis. And then the new hire that comes in later gets half the information or a quarter or, you know, things fall through the cracks. So an online enrollment system, an onboarding system helps make sure that the crucial items are sent out and that the employee has a place to that houses all of their employee benefits information that they can access at any time. Okay. There's a lot of psychology surrounding employee benefits. Um, you need to understand that people are scared of insurance, black and white, uh, contracts. It's a big, scary topic. And sometimes they don't even want to go to their HR and ask questions. They just want to click around and try to find out information for themselves before they ask a question. People don't want to sound stupid. Uh, people don't like to feel vulnerable. They feel vulnerable when they're asking questions. Or it might be a topic that they're afraid of letting you know about. Maybe their kid is in rehab or they want to know about some mental health benefits. That's not something a lot of employees want to talk to their HR or their person that hired them about. So we need to put on, be very empathetic through this process and make sure that we are providing as much information as we can in all of these areas. And one may, way to make sure you're doing that in a auto, more automated way to reduce errors and reduce um, perceived discrimination is to offer a online system. So uh, add-ons to consider, online platforms for admin. These have gotten more and more inexpensive. I mean, it used to be so expensive uh, to offer online enrollment platforms in the past. Now it's um, very inexpensive. 
there are a lot of options. Many of them can align with your payroll uh, to reduce double entry. So HR absolutely loves it. Um, re again, reduces errors, uh, increases uh, consistency, and many brokers advisors offer these at little to no cost to their clients. So it is something that really is a no-brainer, especially if you're a brand new group and you're new to a all the carriers. Uh, one of the downfalls to doing this later is it can get messy if you wait, okay? And it can get messy if you're changing carriers and you're changing online enrollment systems. Oftentimes it's better to just start with a blank, a blank slate and do it right out of the gate. Supplemental benefits. So this is one that a lot of employers feel overwhelmed by the time we talk about this. It is really a no-brainer. Everybody should be offering some sort of supplemental benefits. They're voluntary. They cost zero dollars for the employer. It is some extra admin work. However, the cost of benefit is so large. Employees really, really value this and employees are asking for it. And all of the benchmark information that I look at, and I have lots on my channel. So if you wanna go through and look at those, employees are asking for more options. And when they say more options, they don't mean more dental plans. They mean more to them, more lines of coverage, more options, more ability to buy life insurance if they want to through their employer. Employees are intimidated to go out and buy life insurance on their own. They want their employer to vet insurance care companies for them. So supplemental benefits are employers can pay a portion of them if they want. However, many of them, especially startups, just offer them voluntarily. Employees can be educated. Um, HR doesn't have to worry about educating on every single piece. They do need to introduce the concept to the employees. Again, it's best if it's on an online enrollment system so the employees can see exactly all of the options. However, they should have a call center to ask any questions that come up to a third party. Again, employees do not feel comfortable asking questions, personal, super personal questions to their employer. As much as they may love you and as much as a, of a great relationship you have with your employees, uh, many issues are just too sensitive and too scary to bring up with the employer. So having a third party to lean on to explain all of these options that the employees are asking for is the, the way to go. Okay. So if you have any questions about anything I went over today, I have all the links down below. <laughs> I would love to hear from you. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn or Facebook, and I have those links down below as well. I have an employee benefits uh, questionnaire that also leads to an assessment. So if you want me to take a look at any benefit packages that you have currently, I would be happy to take a look at that. Uh, again, I'm very consultative. I'm very low pressure. I understand that I'm not going to be the best fit for everyone out there. So please take the time, complete that questionnaire if you want a second opinion. Submit a question to be answered and shared through the channel. So if you have a question, I would like to open it up to the channel. So the more questions I get, I'm going to use this channel to answer those questions. I am a strong believer in context and I like to explain the context. Not every employer, not every situation is the same and there are others out there just like you that have the same questions and I get similar questions over and over. However, there are some nuances to how I would answer those in each situation. So if you want to submit a question, please do so in the link below. And if you have an interview request, I'm starting to, to do some interviews and set up some interviews. 
Um, I have a, a 401k specialist coming out this week uh, to go over some new regulations that are uh, coming into California. So employers in California that have over five employees need to get a 401k plan set up ASAP, otherwise there's going to be penalties. And I have questions about that. I do not specialize in 401ks. I focus on medical dental vision, life, disability, and other supplemental benefits. That is my niche. However, I have uh, teams of people that I work with in other areas, such as HR, online enrollment, and of course, 401k. So I want to give you those resources and have the ability to interview this 401k specialist to give you an idea of exactly what the options are going to be for groups of five or more employees in California that need a 401k plan. And I don't see a lot of people addressing this. I have done some searching on the interwebs and I have questions that I, and as I ask questions, I want to share those answers with you so that you're empowered with accurate and up-to-date information on this very important topic. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Hit that like button down below. Take the time to do that now. One, two, three. Thank you. And go ahead and make a comment. Just say, hi, Melissa, or love the video, or hated the video, or you suck, whatever you want to put. <laughs> and please share the video with anyone that you believe will find it valuable. I really appreciate your time today, and I will see you next time.